So my name is Lindsay Tyler and I work with SELA. And um, the panel today is uh, Abigail uh, Kidd, uh, Lori Davidson, Danielle Levy Pinto, uh, Sebastian Nadeau, and I am forgetting somebody because I can't see your names. No, I'm not. Okay. <laughs> So um, let's, uh, so uh, Daniela, do you want to start and just introduce yourself briefly? Sure. Thank you, Lindsay. Hi, uh, everyone. Um, well, so my name is Daniela Levy Pinto. I am the project coordinator with uh, NELS. And um, yeah, I guess I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Abigail, introduce yourself. Sure. So I'm Abigail Kidd. Um, I work at Employment and Social Development Canada in the Office for Disability Issues, and I've been working on the alternate format file since October 2017, so just over three years now. Uh, Sebastian? Uh, hi, everyone. Sebastian Addo. I'm the Director of uh, Services for uh, Public at uh, the ANQ, the ANQ in Montreal. Uh, which is the bigger part of the SQLA, the Quebec uh, Services for Adapted Book. Thank you. And Laurie Davidson. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Laurie Davidson, um, and I'm the Executive Director of uh, CELA, and I've been working um, in accessibility for the last uh, many years. Um, I, um, was at uh, NELS uh, as a project manager and uh, moved to CELA uh, in September of this year. So very excited to be here, thanks. So for the panel, um, they've elected to each address a specific question. So um, let's start with, with Abigail. Um, could you talk about, uh, set the frame for us and describe what the federal strategy is uh, regarding accessible publishing and the background for the development of that strategy and then how it informs or relates to the question of digital literacy? Yeah, happily. So I'll start with the background. So um, a few years before I joined in October 2017, there was a sort of working group project out of the Library and Archives Canada on digital literacy, on, sorry, on alternate product, um, products. It was focused on looking at the gap that existed and addressing it, but unfortunately it didn't go anywhere. It actually failed. Um, and so when I came in, we were just starting to look at um, what was happening in the alternate format landscape. We were hearing from stakeholders about the barriers that this ongoing gap was creating. Um, and we knew that that was out of step with our adoption in June 2016 of the Marrakesh Treaty. Um, and so that was sort of where we were starting from. And we felt like we could need to both better understand the issue and then in order to, once we had done that, we would be able to sort of form a strategy to address it. So we formed the working group on alternate format materials for Canadians with print disabilities in December 2017. Um, the working group included representatives from national disability organizations and consumer groups, including CELA, NELS, and CNIB. It also included representatives from the Canadian publishing industry, the library sector, people with lived experience, people from Indigenous organizations, and Indigenous people with lived experience, um, and officials from, the, from Heritage Canada, from Library and Archives Canada, and from Innovation Science and Economic Development Canada, as well as from Employment and Social Development Canada, where I work. The working group's mandate was to identify elements required to develop a strategy um, to address the limited availability of alternate format materials in Canada. So out of that working group, so the working group met five times and we sort of closed the working group mid 2018, end of spring 2018. Um, and then we worked internally to develop a strategy that was at, at a federal level which was announced in budget 2019. So the strategy had two core elements that was, were informed by the contributions of the working group. The first element is addressing gaps in technology through the alternate format business technology challenge. The challenge, as we refer to it, um, is a, leveraging a program out of innovation, um, out of, sorry, innovation, science, and economic development Canada. The program is called Innovation Solutions Canada. Um, and it's leveraging that program to challenge small businesses to uh, solve issues that are technological or digital in nature. Usually that program is used to solve issues around like 
using AI to better serve Canadians through internal processes. Um, but we were the first use of that sort of program to challenge businesses in Canada to solve a social issue. So we asked them to address um, issues around um, the production. So technology that limits production or makes production more costly and issues around devices. So um, the technology that prevents devices from being accessible, affordable, or um, somehow solves the issue of technical literacy and devices that makes them easier to use. So that was launched in 2019, or sorry, 2020, February 2020. And it um, closed around the summer 2020 and we're just working on uh, solidifying phase one of that. So that's one piece of the strategy. The second piece of the strategy on a federal level is the use of um, the Canada Book Fund. So you heard from Sarah about that yesterday. So it's using the Canada Book Fund to support independent Canadian publishers to become accessible at source. So to produce accessible digital books at source. Um, that's currently um, in year three of five. Um, and so we'll be sort of in a really good position to understand how that's going, what needs to go come out of that um, at the end of this year. So that sort of like those two core pieces, we felt like addressed a lot of the issues, but there's still gaps that remain. There's distribution issues, which we've heard about and which I know the Canada Book Fund is considering in terms of how they uh, move forward into the final years. There's gaps for multinational publishers as, um, as the federal government, we don't have control over what multinationals do um, and we can't fund them to do stuff. And so there's always gonna be those gaps and it requires like pressure from the market to shift that. Um, there's gaps with broadband. So we know that there's a lot of people that don't can't access digital books because they don't have broadband access or internet access. And then finally, there's gaps um, in terms of format, which is sort of what we're gonna be addressing through these conversations today. So we know that there are still uh, Canadians with current disabilities who rely on physical materials and that the federal strategy does not address the costs with conversion. And as much as we would hope to address that through technology innovations, it's still gonna be there. There's people that need access to Braille in order to read and access literacy and e-Braille devices are really limited. And then there's also a lot of senior Canadians, like it's very common for senior Canadians to acquire print disabilities. They're sort of the highest proportion of the population and they require access to things like Daisy Books and CD. And it's those people, particularly older, um, middle-aged to senior Canadians who have new print disabilities that we are most concerned with when it comes to how do we how do we support them in accessing um, e-readers and accessing digital books that they are able to benefit from the strategy as well. And that's sort of where the digital literacy component comes in. So digital literacy look, work would look at um, helping Canadians with print disabilities acquire literacy skills that are required to read accessible digital formats, um, which would have an impact on who can access books, but also the level of conversion required and the costs associated with that. That's sort of like the stage that we're starting from today, I think. Great, thank you, Abigail. That was a very thorough background to the, the sort of policy or strategy framework that we're looking at. Um, so Sebastian, in, uh, in your experience, who are the people who, and you know, maybe Abigail has alluded to this a bit, but you can expand on who are the people who, who may require training in this context and or um, access to technology in order to participate successfully in the accessible publishing ecosystem? Um, what are their needs um, and what challenges might they face? Yeah, uh, thank you, Lindsay, for your question. Um, as the head of a public service and considering the entire reading ecosystem, I believe that all stakeholders uh, would benefit from improving their digital uh, literacy or even their digital awareness. Um, at the very beginning of the chain, there are publisher and producer uh, who needs to understand all the positive elements uh, that can be represented by, for example, uh, documents that are born accessible or the closest it can, it can be. Um, reality, which is now plausible thanks to the digital world. Uh, this new reality, once well established in practice for institutions such as BNQ, uh, would multiply by a couple of hundred of time our uh, purchasing power for adapt uh, documents. Uh, authors, publisher, and the works themselves uh, would then be more widely distributed and therefore more uh, better known. 
Uh, then of course the user, the, the users themselves. Uh, we work with various organizations and partners to equip a very varied uh, clientele to take advantage of a growing and changing offer. There are many sources of information and entertainment these days. Uh, for many young and old, uh, training is, is essential to open their horizons. Uh, moreover, if we go back to the reality of a library, it is certainly easier to exchange overseas uh, to exchange overseas electronic file than multiple uh, volume braille document. So for the user. Uh, digital literacy means more choice and open doors. Uh, but we must not fall into the trap of being completely digital either. Uh, many users are and always will be only comfortable pressing the play button on a player to listen to an audiobook, and that's fine too. Many fully fu functional readers prefer the contact of paper. Uh, the possibility of choosing physical documents, a paper braille, let's say, should therefore remain for everyone. Um, for us, more than 80% of our loans uh, of ADAPT documents are made in physical format because it meets the needs of our patrons. Uh, and between the producer and the user, there are the organization that provides contents, platforms, uh, medium, and so on, organization like uh, BNQ, SILAS, NELS, and others. Uh, and we too need to sharpen our digital literacy and train as much as possible in technology in order to play our role uh, to the fullest. My personal point of view is that we even have to be at the forefront so that we can see what's coming, uh, make adjustment while keeping one foot firmly in the years before because our role is to smooth out the challenges on every uh, user side. And as you all know, uh, the challenges in this ecosystem are multiple. Uh, there are, of course, all the challenge related to accessibility per se, but also those root in the concept that I'll resume by uh, what's, uh, what's in there for me. Uh, a user may not understand what he or she will gain from using this or that technology, or even just from learning something new. Uh, in my opinion, every stakeholder has a role to play in developing knowledge uh, in their needs and the var various needs of others. Uh, and I believe that a summit like the one we are attending today serves that specific goal or even meets higher level by demystifying needs and challenges we take part in gaining literacy ourselves. Thank you very much, uh, Sebastian. Uh, Laurie, um, could you talk about uh, the, the groups or um, organizations that are currently involved in training in digital literacy or providing access again to technology? Yeah, thanks, Lindsay. Um, and thanks, Abigail and Sebastian. Um, I think you've both hit on some uh, some points that um, that I share um, with your observations. Uh, you know, in terms of of looking at um, uh, social inclusion and digital literacy, we uh, do definitely have to keep in mind that the the choice and format of material um, that we need to uh, make make that choice be available to all people in Canada with a print disability. Um, and that could have to do with their economic means, it could have to do with their comfort level or ability to learn new technology, what their internet connectivity is like and whether they have access to the same kinds of digital services as other people do. Um, and also the specific nature of the person's print disability can also inform you know, what kind of format. So that's the broader perspective of, of how though digital um, delivery we want to move in that direction, we can't leave people behind who still require those physical formats of delivery and that cost and that um, and that distribution of those physical formats, um, there, there has to be an infrastructure behind that to make sure that those services are still supported as well. Um, so in relation to what's out there in terms of training, I think one of the um, observations um, that, um, that as a group that we had discussed before that we were speaking to is that there's really 
quite a patchwork of services across Canada that different people in Canada have access to different training services depending on where they live. Um, and so, as we know, um, you know, and Sebastian uh, spoke to what the services um, can be available for people in, in Quebec, uh, but we've also got across the country different programs in place, not only for uh, different provinces and territories have different programs for providing the actual devices themselves, the actual, you know, assistant, uh, assistive technology devices. Um, which can impact then what are the choices available to people with print disabilities and how they can access content. Um, uh, then there's um, a lot of sort of uh, uh, consumer groups or community groups, and I speak here of groups such as the Canadian Council for the Blind, uh, Braille Literacy Canada, um, CNIB, and they all, all offer different training of different sorts um, to their user communities. Um, there's uh, uh, CNIB does vision loss rehab and um, the, VL, the VLR centers across Canada do varying things in each of the different provinces and territories. We know within the library environment, um, you know, CELA, NELS, VA and Q offer various webinars and training. Um, uh, to users, but also to libraries and then each local library will offer their own kinds of, of, um, of training. Um, let me know if I'm cutting up. I'm getting a note that my internet connection is unstable. So can you still hear me? It was a little fuzzy there for a minute, but you're okay now. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, you know, so very much there's a lot of different uh, players in the landscape who are doing this training. And um, I think it can be quite confusing uh, for the user sometimes to know where to go to and where to get um, the kind of training that they require, either to be able to feel comfortable with adapting to the new digital modes of delivery, but also to make sure that those digital modes of delivery work for them in whatever environment and format that they need to be able to read. Um, um, and then I'll also just uh, speak that there's, of course, the whole world of uh, K to 12 and post secondary and with the, um, the various organizations that support those readers. And that's an, another um, uh, sort of other place where people can access training. Um, so I think that that environment is, um, is really understanding the patchwork nature of that environment is also a, an essential part of the conversation to ensure or try to figure out how we can build a framework that isn't so confusing or that isn't um, perhaps has different levels of equity across Canada and that we can actually form a framework that helps um, everyone in Canada who needs this, uh, who needs the, uh, the training and to make sure that we are as inclusive as possible. All right, thanks, Lori. Not so confusing, I think would be a good, <laughs> a good direction to move in. I think we're seeing a picture that there's a, there's a lot happening and it, and it fits together in different ways or, or not, um, depending. Um, so, Daniela, um, you're the, the last panelist today. Could you talk about what gaps um, and what opportunities you think exist for delivering um, digital literacy and training? and to what extent do you think readers with print disabilities have equitable access to the technology to read born accessible books? Thank you, Lindsay, for the question. And uh, I think I will echo <laughs> some of what the other panelists have, uh, have already said. In regards to gaps, um, what Laurie was uh, mentioning about kind of a more uh, um, patchy, landscape of different uh, organizations, uh, uh, perhaps at different levels, uh, offering different types of training. Uh, this results in that not everyone in Canada has the same level of access. Um, also, gaps would result from uh, lack of ability or lack of um, uh, an internet connection. Not everyone has internet at home. And uh, this is especially relevant in the time of a pandemic. How can you deliver training uh, on digital literacy um, if you can perhaps not reach uh, the people that you're trying to train? I mean, uh, Zoom is a, seems to be, a, or could be for some, an easy technology. But if we're dealing with aging populations uh, that don't necessarily know how to use it, um, so the format is a bit of a, of a question um, in, in terms of how do you provide uh, training for different demographics, different formats or, or, or different mediums like 
videos perhaps, uh, podcasts, that's something that uh, Nels uh, is working on, kind of uh, following um, paths for, for users to get books. Um, but it's complex because sometimes uh, some readers require not only to learn one reader, one, uh, one tool, um, but also uh, people sometimes have to yeah, have a Dropbox account or other storage, uh, cloud storage for them to load the content into those applications. So um, that's, that's another potential gap that can be created. The more elements you add that people have to learn or the more, more tools or technologies, it can be a bit more complicated. Um, and that's, uh, that will depend, of course, on, on people's uh, level with technology, um, maybe their age. Uh, we always think about seniors, uh, of course, who require um, CDs because for them, learning to use something else uh, may be different. I, w I wonder, though, um, Maybe this will change when the new wave of seniors in like 10 or 15 years is there. Like, uh, I guess what I'm trying to say is the more people know technology, if they already know it, if they age, or when they age, this will not be an issue, but that's a gap that we have now. So how can we address it in the time of a pandemic? I don't have the answer. Um, maybe, maybe training by phone, but again, it's a uh, different, um, different uh, outside elements uh, um, also complicate the training. But there, at, at the same time, these are opportunities for, for training and for um, teaching people how to, uh, how to use this. Um, something else, uh, maybe different, uh, uh, I think, a, a, an important element um, and piece of the work is again making developers aware that the technologies, the mainstream technologies, why they are not working if they are too complicated. Um, there's a distinction, very important distinction that matters here when we talk about uh, uh, training and inclusion between accessibility and usability, right? The, the fact that something is accessible that maybe follow or it may follow accessibility standards and may be accessible with a screen reader, does not mean that it's very easy to use. So um, I think that uh, conversations also need to happen with uh, developers and also for them to provide good training uh, tools. I consider myself, uh, I'm a user of assistive technologies and I don't always find very clear instructions. Um, so that's another gap but also, again, uh, another opportunity. So it's, uh, I think all these gaps we can, or we should be thinking about how to address them and uh, how to provide the training from, from different levels, um, really to ensure that uh, the ecosystem is truly equitable um, and, uh, and address some of the other pieces that may uh, impact the equity here. Um, other panelists have also talked about the, the relevance of flexibility in format um, for accessibility. And I, I really want to emphasize that as well. Um, we should not be mandating people what formats to use. We should be providing them information um, and the training and for them to be able to use the format that, that they really uh, need. Um, so I think I will leave it here for now. Great, thank you, Daniela. Uh, we have a few minutes if there's any um, last thoughts um, before I, I stop the recording. Um, if I could add uh, here as well, I think uh, information about formats um, is important. Not everyone knows what EPUBs are. Um, so it's really, I think, the, the, the awareness creation piece uh, that I think all of us working in accessible publishing and accessible reading are doing. Um, 
so that users also know what's available to them. One, you know, once they know, then then um, perhaps it, it it would be a matter of building uh, little maps. Uh, you know, if, if uh, formats and which tools to use them, and uh, uh, yeah, but then the how do you convey this information for digital literacy in uh, for someone who's not uh, tech savvy in the pandemic world, that's that's something I still don't don't know. Yeah, I think that's a good reality check. <laughs> um, all right, great. So I'm going to uh, stop the recording now.